Even when we turn points to points or equations to equations, with the same four equations. You just have to know what you're starting with and obviously end with the same. If you start with an equation, end with an equation. If you start with a point, end with a point. It's a little confusing because you're using equations to convert. So there are equations no matter what that you're using. You just have to know what you start with determines what you're going to end with. So our next example, these are all just convert. And graph. So what gives away polar coordinates for this equation? It's not the pi over 4 part. It's the theta part. All right. Uh, you know it's an equation because there's an equal sign in it. Points have parentheses and a comma. So that's the main difference. All right, so we're going to convert this. There is no R, so every conversion equation that has an R is not useful. So there's only one without an R, and that's y over x equals tan theta. So we're using this right here. All I know is theta is always pi over 4. So I'm just going to take the pi over 4 put it in for theta value. Easy question, what's tangent pi over 4? That's 1. So we have our rectangular equation now. y over x equals 1. What can I do algebraically to make this a lot nicer? Yep, so I multiply by x. So fractions suck. Why have fractions if you don't have to? This equation is y equals x, right there. What type of graph does this have? It's almost too simple. It's a line. What's the slope? One. One. Y intercept? Zero. Better be zero because y is x, so we're across the y axis. Better have both coordinates zero, not just one of them. All right, graph. There we go. That's y equals x. If you really are obsessed with mx plus b, you can write it y equals 1x plus zero. That makes you happier. So it looks like a line you're familiar with. So there's a graph right there. Should intersect the origin, but. It's close enough. So where in the world's pi over 4 fit into this graph? What measurement is pi over 4 on this graph right here? So there's an angle, and the angle will be right there is pi over 4. So every polar coordinate with pi over 4 as the angle is along this line. Now, how do we get the bottom left part of the line? That's all the radiuses, radii that are negative. So if your radius is 0, you got the origin positive. If you got the upper right part negative, you have the lower left part. So you could grasp some of these in polar coordinates without actually converting them. So if I gave you a weird angle like pi over 8, if you had theta equals pi over 8, you could grab it. You just measure pi over 8. It's about half of pi over 4. And draw your line right there. I will give you an angle that's nice, so you could take a tangent of it. So it'll be some angle you recognize. I should circle or put a box around the converted. I said convert and graph. So this y equals x is the converted equation in rectangular coordinates. And I'll go ahead and put a box around the other rectangular coordinate equation. We've got that one, x squared plus y squared equals 3 squared. We convert it to polar. Technically, I was done the step before the one I'm putting a box around, because everything was already in polar. I just 
factored it a little bit. Uh, what else? The best version of this circle was probably the standard form right here, the last one. There's too many boxes here. Okay. All right, that's good enough. All right, convert and graph. What conversion equation should I use? What's that? Oh, it's an R. We'll have Bs very soon when we have vectors. We'll use Us and Vs and Ws. But for now, it's just R status, Xs and Ys. That's exactly right. So I see an R cos theta, so we use the equation that has an R cos theta. And that equation says R cos theta is x. So you only need about two brain cells for this conversion. Don't overthink it. You got R cos theta, and you know that's x. And there's no other, there was no other like theta or r's over here next to the three. That was it, just three. All right. What type of, so this is a linear equation. Everything is to the first power or constant. What type of line is this? You can't write it mx plus b form. It's a vertical line. So it has undefined slope. Now remember, you can always do the clueless method if you're not sure. How do you plot points on this? There is no y, so y could be anything you want. So x is negative 3. So we'll say that's negative 3 right there. X could also be negative 3 up there, negative 3 up there, et cetera, et cetera, and you make a line. So there's our X equals negative 3 graph. There are a few other graphs, uh, a few other types of equations that you can convert to rectangular. Some of them are on web work. There's more inside your book. And this is where I'm going to cut off the midterm material right here. So this is exactly what we were doing yesterday. So midterm two is everything above this line. So I think it makes sense to start a new section. And actually, yes, we will. So now we're going to graph in polar coordinates. So we're actually going to graph polar coordinates now. So we're not going to convert. In this section, we're not going to first convert. We're going to graph straight in polar coordinates. Uh, the main reason is uh, we can absolutely convert algebraically, but you're going to get equations that have really weird graphs that you've never seen before. So you can absolutely convert them, but it's not very useful in general for these types. So I very carefully selected problems from the last section that we can convert easily. The circle is probably the hardest example of that. There's a couple, I think there's one or two web work problems that are a little funky that you have to think a little outside the box. They may have a secant or cosecant. You can use a reciprocal. That's one over cosine or sine and convert that way. But in this section, we are going to graph in polar coordinates. So the title is graphs of polar equations. I'm going to write in polar coordinates. We did just graph polar equations, but we did it in rectangular coordinates. So now we're going to keep in polar coordinates. So one of the first things we learned about graphs was, well, we did x and y intercepts, but we also did symmetry. And that's another big property of graphs. So we're going to start out with symmetry here. We're going to use symmetry because it lets us graph part of it and then use that symmetry to reflect it across one of the two axes or rotate it halfway. 
So we're going to look at symmetry first. And of course, we're looking for polar symmetry. So the first symmetry I can remember was, I think we started x-axis symmetry, and then we did y-axis symmetry. So let's start x-axis here. Now x-axis is sort of a bad word because it, for polar symmetry because it has the letter x in it. So it's not the best description here for symmetry and polar coordinates. Let's look at x-axis symmetry. All right, we can agree these points have x-axis symmetry. They're across the x-axis from each other. Now we have to think of polar coordinates, so I don't want to write xy, and then the other one is x negative y. That's rectangular coordinates. So I want to go polar coordinates. So I need to draw out an r and a theta, and of course this point is r theta. Does a radius change when I look at the point across the x-axis. So our radius should stay the same. Something's better change or else our point's not changing. What does change here? And what happens to theta? Negative theta. So instead of go clockwise, go counterclockwise. Go the opposite. So this angle is negative theta. So you're going to take r theta and the symmetric point across the x-axis is r negative theta. So now we're ready to write our test here. x-axis test, we're going to replace theta with negative theta. So that's our test. You're going to say, can I take out theta and put negative theta? And do I get the same equation? So that's our x-axis. We're going to go y-axis next. Now, we didn't really look at x-axis symmetry with functions. If I was thinking of y as a function of x, just with these two points, would I pass the vertical line test? Nope. With just two points with x-axis symmetry, you fail the vertical line test. So x-axis symmetry pretty much never happened with functions because the only function that has x-axis symmetry is the function y equals 0, also known as the x-axis. That's the only function that uh, is a function and has x-axis symmetry. Any other function that has a y-coordinate that's not 0 is not actually a function if it has x-axis symmetry. So we didn't really look at x-axis symmetry with functions because there's only one function that has it, so it's kind of boring. Uh, that's very untrue with polar equations. So polar equations, we saw a whole bunch circles failed the vertical line test. I don't think we saw a spiral yet, but spirals failed the vertical line test. So vertical line test is out the window when it comes to polars. Uh, Y-axis. We'll draw our picture first. So y-axis symmetry, what quadrant would I draw my symmetric point? So it's going to be quadrant 2. And it needs to be about right there. So first of all, does the radius look like it changed? No, not really. Better be the same. Uh, same distance away from the origin. I'm going to label R below because I'm going to label the angle above. So that R right there. Now the angle is more tricky. So let's break out the blue pen. Now I don't want the R there anymore either. Jeez. So we're going to do this very slowly. 
that blue angle I just drew right there, what's the name of that angle? That's theta, right? It's the same angle we got on our first quadrant right there. Now it's acting right here, it's acting like a reference angle, basically. It's the distance to the x-axis. That's not the angle I'm really looking for. The one I really want is this angle right here. So the way to think about this, what I really want to do is go all the way over and then come back like that. So I want to go pi, and then how do I come back theta? I'm going to do minus theta or plus a negative theta. So we're going to go pi, a half rotation, and then come back theta. So that was theta. The angle I really want is go pi, and then come back theta right there. So if I want to label negative theta, I'll put a negative sign, and then negative theta will actually go the other direction. It'll go from the negative x-axis back there. So go half rotation and then come back theta, or come back negative theta. So any questions on this right here? Now this one is harder to remember than the other one. So you can reason your way through this one, but you may want to put in some memorization just so you don't, have, you don't spend extra one or two minutes trying to figure out, ah, what is symmetry uh, in polar coordinates. So our test, we're going to replace theta with pi minus theta. There's only one symmetry left. It's not z-axis. What's our last symmetry we could have? It's called origin. Now, just a warning about drawing pictures and then making conclusions. I only really drew as if the point was in quadrant one. This also works no matter what quadrant you're in. So I did sort of the easy case to think about. If I did other, let's see. I'll just do it for uh, x-axis because it's a little easier to see. For example, if we got a point down here, so we got an r and a theta, x-axis symmetric point is going to appear up here. Pretty obvious, r is the same. Now. How do I get over here? It's a little weird. Theta, the way I drew it, is actually negative. So I had to make a negative number positive. You just put another negative sign in front. So that'll be negative theta. So it works in quadrant three, works in four, uh, works in two. Uh, and now you could say, well, how do you know you measured it that way? What if you went the long way around? All right. We'll measure the long way around. And we'll say that is theta right there. Where does negative theta go? I better use another color. Negative theta is going to go the same amount in the opposite direction. So the negative theta is going to look like that right there. I don't really want to label negative theta, but it goes the same amount in the opposite direction. It'll work even if I did a full rotation or 20 rotations. When I flip it around, it's going to go 20 rotations the other way. So I'm just warning you about this because when you draw things, a lot of times you make assumptions. It's like, oh, this definitely works in quadrant one when my angle is between 0 and pi over 2. But what I'm showing you here works uh, is universal. All right, origin. What in the world does origin symmetry even mean? So 
So what does it use the origin for? Obviously, use the origin for something. So you could reflect about the origin. That's one way to think about it. Or you could rotate halfway around at the origin. That's another way to think about it. Uh, reflect about the origin, in my opinion, is harder to think about. And I'll show you why in a minute. But rotating is a much easier way to think about it. So our symmetric point is going to be down here. Now if I measure the angle this way, what angle did I just label right there? Almost. So I just labeled theta right there as a reference angle. What do I have to do to theta to get all the way over there? Yeah, add pi to it. So I got to go a half rotation and then another theta after that. So this is pi plus theta. So we go half rotation and then another theta after that. So any questions on, on that idea? <coughs> So our test, replace theta with pi plus theta. Now, what if I let go of the rule that r has to be positive? What's another name for this point if I use regular theta as my angle? What r do I have to use to get down to this point? So we'll go theta direction, but go backwards or negative. So we've got negative r comma theta. That's another name for this point. So you could either replace theta with pi plus theta or replace r with minus r. There's actually two tests for origin symmetry. So there are all three tests. So a note, you cannot have two symmetries. So how many symmetries can you have? You can have no symmetries, zero. You could have one symmetry, or you can have three symmetries. So you can't have two. So this can speed up your test a little bit. Uh, if you test in the order I wrote, x-axis, y-axis, so let's say you get x-axis and y-axis. What do you know about origin symmetry? You, if you pass x and y-axis symmetry, you have to get origin symmetry. So if you get x and y axis, you don't actually have to go through the origin symmetry test. You can if you want to, to be sure, uh, but you can't have two. Now what happens if I get yes for x axis and no for y axis? I can't have origin because that would give me two symmetries. So you can use a little bit of logic to shortcut some of these. So if you get uh, if you check x and y axis, and if you get both of them, you don't have to test origin. If you get one of them, you don't have to test origin. So if you go in this order, as long as you get uh, one and or both, you don't have to test origin. What happens if you get no x axis, no y axis? So you could, you could get origin. So the only time you actually need to run the origin test is if you get a no and a no in which case you may just have origin symmetry. There's also a chance you have no symmetries, in which case you've tested all three and you know they all fail. So you're infrequently going to test origin symmetry, because most of the time you're going to know if you have it or not. Question? Yes. So you can the 
So you can't have 0, 1, or 3. So you can't have two of them. Correct. You can say, hey, there's all three symmetries happening. If you know two of them are happening, and you didn't make a mistake determining that, um, you know, if you make a mistake, you may think you're passing two, but like you've tested all three and you think you're passing two, that would be a mistake. So you either falsely passed one or falsely failed one. Or more. There may be more than one mistake. Uh, but you can't, what I'm saying is you can't have two. So if you're running your test and you're like, oh, I got x and y but not origin. No, you don't. Somewhere in there, there's a mistake. Correct. So we need a table of values here. We're going to be graphing a lot of square roots of 1 half, square root of 3, and all that. So here we're going to use some approximate values. Is it I am? Is it approx I mate or A mate? I mate? All right, approximate values. Two square root of three. Oops. I'm using the uh, squiggle equals, which is approximately equals. And this is approximately 3.46. Regular square root three is approximately 1.73. Square root 3 over 2, 0.87. 1 over square root 2, 0.71. And if we double this, it would be approximately 1.42. You can use decimals in web work answers, but I think they need five places of accuracy. So these won't work in web work. You need to get a bit more accurate. Although you, what you should be using is the exact value. No reason to mess around with decimals in web work if you don't have to. All right, so we're going to use these values. We're also going to use symmetry, and we're going to graph using the clueless method. So we're going to be plotting points and then doing our best to connect them with a smooth curve and then applying symmetry at the end. Uh, the other to test for symmetry, we need the sum difference formula for cosine and sine. So I'll write cos A plus minus B is cos A cos B minus plus the sine A sine B. And then similarly for sine A plus minus B is sine A cos B plus minus cos A sine B. You don't need to memorize these. I'll put these on the, uh, everything you see right here will be on your quiz next week. So you don't need to memorize any of these approximate values or the sum difference. You don't need to memorize anything in here. Now we're going to start on some graphs. Now, if you think the clueless method is silly, you're partially right. But how do you think a calculator or a computer graphs functions? They literally plot whatever your resolution is, 1,000 points. If you have one of those TIs, maybe they plot 100 points. That's it. It's a bunch of dots. That's all they do. So graphing utilities use a clueless method. It's used all the time. 
So calculator, you get on Desmos, uh, any of those, they use the clueless method. So it is used all the time. Uh, who's going to be an engineer? That's it. All right. So you're going to use uh, the clueless method because you're going to use a lot of graphing utilities. But you're also going to learn in calculus that you can approximate things with polynomials and all that. So there's actually quite a few estimations and approximations that you're going to be using. So a lot of these tools, even though they seem a little bit silly, uh, are very useful overall. So our equation R equals 1 minus sine theta. Now initially, there's no reason to think you can't convert this in graph. So let's go ahead and try, see what we get. I'll do all this in blue. So I see a sine theta. So certainly, I'm going to use r sine theta equals y. So I at least need that. Now, how do I get an r in front of sine theta? How do I get an r in front of sine theta? I could just write one there. But what algebra move puts one there? So I got to multiply everybody by r. If I subtract an r, it'll be sine theta minus r. I need a sine theta times r. So if I multiply everything by r, I'll get this right here. r squared equals r minus r sine theta. All right, r squared, that's no problem. x squared plus y squared. Now r by itself, unfortunately, there's only one way to write it. x squared plus y squared with the square root on it. Minus r sine theta is y. All right, we converted to rectangular coordinates. Do you really like square roots? Probably not really. So we can get rid of the square root. We're basically going to square it. But if I square it right now, I do get first term squared minus last term, or plus last term squared. But I also get an inside outside term. So if I FOIL it in this form, it'll look like x squared plus y squared, square root squared, minus 2y plus y squared. So if I square the right side, that's what I'll get because of the outside inside part. So I don't lose the square root at all. In fact, it looks like it gets worse. So I don't like that move. There is a way to get rid of the square root. And we have to first get rid of that minus y. Easy question, how do we get rid of the minus y? Add to both sides. Now we can square root both sides, or square root both sides. So I'm gonna square both sides. Right side's super easy because that's the whole reason we squared it. Get that square root out. All right, left side, however. That's what squaring looks like. Thing times itself. You have to, I call this super foiling, but you're distributing. So how do you distribute trinomials? Very carefully. Basically first term times everything in the second one. And then second term. And then finally the third term gets distributed. So I'm gonna have nine terms. So we got x to the fourth plus something x squared y squared plus x squared y. So that is the x squared times everything in the second one. Now I'm going to do plus y squared times everything in the second one. 
and I'm going to write in alphabetical order. So we got x squared, y squared, plus y squared, y squared, y to the fourth, plus y squared times y, which is y cubed. All right, so that is the y squared times everything. And now we're going to go last up, y times everything. So we're getting x squared y plus y cubed plus, uh-oh, y plus y cubed plus y squared. Oh, this is like a real joy to graph. I can combine like terms, maybe cancel out a couple things. But we did convert to rectangular, so we got x and y's, we got no square roots. Um, unfortunately, this is a fourth degree equation. So you could ask a graphing utility to graph it. All they're going to do is the clueless method. They're going to plot 1,000 points in a hundredth of a second and then connect them with what looks like a smooth curve. All right, so what I did here is show you, you can convert. But what it's hard to do is graph this beast. All right, let's go with the original. I think the original looked a lot nicer. All right, that's angry face. All right, yes, we successfully converted it, but that was not terribly helpful. So we're going to switch back to the black marker and do this the reasonable way. R equals 1 minus sine theta. So it's always good to get algebra practice. I could combine like terms. Maybe it gets 20% less ugly, but it's certainly not going to be a nice equation. So first up, we're going to look for symmetry. So I'm going to do x-axis first, replace theta with minus theta. So what property of sine do I use to deal with that negative theta? Even odd. Even odd. So sine even or odd? Sine is odd, so that negative pulls through the sine function. Cosine's even, cosine doesn't care about that negative. So sine's odd, so this is one minus negative sine regular theta, which is one plus sine theta. Is that the equation we started with? Nope, that minus turned to a plus. So this is not the original. So we're going to fail, fail x-axis. So x-axis is out. So right away, unless I made a mistake, I can be sure that there's not going to be, I either get y-axis or origin, but I can't get both. So I know right away I can't get the other two. I either get one of the others or none of the others. So y-axis, replace theta with pi minus theta. And what we're going to use here is the difference uh, formula for sine, which I wrote up here. So we have sine of a minus b, so we're using the one with the minuses in it. So go ahead and apply this with the minuses.
So is that what we started with? R equals 1 minus sine theta. That's exactly what we started with. So this is the original, so we're going to pass. All right, so we have y axis. I'm going to put a couple of boxes around it so I know there's y axis symmetry. I don't need to go and test origin. Uh, assuming I didn't make a mistake, you can't just get two symmetries. So I'm not going to test origin. So what's the point of this? It lets us basically graph less points. So we know there's y-axis symmetry. What does that look like? What happens on the right of the y-axis happens on the left of the y-axis. So I know whatever happens on the right side happens on the left side. So I get to choose. Do I want to graph points on the right side or the left side? I like to go right side because that is uh, basically negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So we're going to graph on the right side right here. So everything on the right side we're going to graph. So we're going to graph for theta between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So that is the right half of our uh, coordinate plane. And then we're going to, whatever we get, we're going to reflect it across the y-axis at the end. All right, clueless method involves a big chart of values. So we're going to put all the theta values we know between negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So we'll draw our clueless chart next. So we got our theta column. You're going to need some space to the right, more than you might think. So these are all the theta values I know between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Well, all the ones I know the sine value of. So we'll fill in the rest of this chart tomorrow.